Aeschylus. My lord? Of government, the properties to unfold would seem in me to affect speech and discourse, since I am put to know that your own science exceeds in that the list of all advice my strength can give you. Then no more remains, but that to your sufficiency, as your worth is able, and let them work. The nature of our people, our city's institutions, and the terms for common justice, you are as pregnant in as art and practice hath enriched any that we remember. There is our commission, from which we would not have you warp. Call hither, I say, bid come before us, Angela. What figure of us, think you, he will bear? For you must know we have with special soul elected him our absence to supply, lent him our terror, dressed him with our love, and given his deputation all the organs of our own power. What think you of it? If any in Vienna be of worth to undergo such ample grace and honor, it is Lord Angelo. Look where he comes. Always obedient to your grace's will. I come to know your pleasure. Angelo, there is a kind of character in thy life that to the observer doth thy history fully unfold. Thyself and thy belongings are not thine own so proper as to waste thyself upon thy virtues, they on thee. Heaven doth with us as we with torches do, not light them for themselves. For if our virtues did not go forth of us, twere all alike as if we had them not. Spirits are not finely touched, but too fine issues. Nor nature never lends the smallest scruple of her excellence, but like a thrifty goddess, she determines herself the glory of a creditor, both thanks and use. But I do bend my speech to one that can my part in him advertise. Hold, therefore, Angelo. In our remove, be thou at full ourself. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. Old Aeschylus, though first in question, is thy secondary. Take thy commission. Oh, good, my lord. Let there be some more test made of my metal before so noble and so great a figure be stamped upon it. No more evasion. We have with a leavened and prepared choice proceeded to you. Therefore, take your honors. Our haste from hence is of so quick condition that it prefers itself and leaves unquestioned matters of needful value. We shall write to you as time and our concernings shall import you and how it goes with us and to look to know what doth befall you here. So, fare you well. To the hopeful execution do I leave you of your commission. Yet give leave, my lord, that we may bring you something on the way. My haste may not admit it, nor need you, on my honor, have to do with any scruple. Your scope is as mine own, so to enforce or qualify the laws as to your soul seems good. Give me your hand. I'll privily away. I love the people, but do not like to stage me to their eyes. Though it do well, I do not relish well their loud applause and Arvey's vehement. Nor do I think the man of safe discretion that does affect it. Once more, fare you well. The heavens give safety to your purposes. Lead forth and bring you back in happiness. I thank you. Fare you well. I shall desire you, sir, to give me leave to have free speech with you. And it concerns me to look into the bottom of my place. A power I have, but of what strength and nature I am not yet instructed. Tis so with me. Let us withdraw together, and we may soon our satisfaction have touching that point. I'll wait upon your honor.
<laughs> if the duke with the other dukes come not to composition with the king of Hungary, why then all the dukes fall upon the king. Heaven grant us its peace, but not the king of Hungary. Amen. Thou concludest, like the sanctimonious pirate that went to sea with the Ten Commandments, but scraped one out of the table. Thou shalt not steal. Aye, that he raised. Why, it was a commandment to command the captains and all the rest from their functions. They put forth to steal. There's not a soldier of us all that in the thanksgiving before meat do relish the petition world that prays for peace. I never heard any soldier dislike it. I believe thee, for I think thou never wast where grace was said. No? A dozen times at least. What, in metre? In any proportion or in any language? I think, or in any religion. Why, why not? Grace is grace, despite of all controversy. As, for example, thou thyself art a wicked villain, despite of all grace. Well, there went but a pair of shears between us. I grant, as there may, between the lists and the velvet, thou art the list. And thou the velvet. <laughs> oh, thou art good velvet. Thou art a three-piled piece, I warrant thee. Oh. I had as lief be a list of an English kersey as be piled, as thou art piled for a French velvet. Do I speak feelingly now? I think thou dost, and indeed with most painful feeling of thy speech. Uh, I will, out of thine own confession, learn to begin thy health, but whilst I live, forget to drink after thee. I think I have done myself wrong, have I not? Yes, that thou hast, whether thou art tainted or free. Behold, behold where madam litigation comes. <laughs> I have purchased as many diseases under her roof as comes to... To what, I pray? Judge. To 3,000 uh, dollars a year? I am more. A French crown more. <laughs> thou art always figuring diseases in me. But thou art full of error. I am sound. Nay, not as one would say healthy, but so sound as things that are hollow. Thy bones are hollow. Impiety has made a feast of thee. Oh, now! Which of your hips has the most profound sciatica? <laughs> well, well, there's one yonder arrested and carried to prison was worth five thousand of you all. That I pray thee. Marry, sir, that's Claudio, senior Claudio. Ah, Claudio to prison? Tis not so. Nay, oh. but on how tis so. I saw him arrested, saw him carried away, oh. and which is more, within these three days, his head's to be chopped off. <laughs> but after all this fooling, I would not have it so. Art thou sure of this? I'm too sure of it. And it's for getting Madame Julietta with child. Believe me, this may be. He promised to meet me two hours since, and he was ever precise in promise keeping. Besides, you know, we draw something near to the speech we had for such a purpose. Oh, but most of all, agreeing with the proclamation. Away, let's go learn the truth of it. Ah. Alas, what with the war, what with the sweat, and what with the gallows, and what with poverty, I'm cast and shrunk. Now, oh, now, what's the news with you? Yonder man is carried to prison. Where? What's he done? A woman. But what's his offence? Groping for traps in a peculiar river. <laughs> what? Is there a maid with child by him? No, but there's a woman with maid by him. <laughs> <laughs> you have not heard of the proclamation, have you? What proclamation, man? All houses in the suburbs of Vienna must be plucked down. And what to become of those in the city? They shall stand for siege. They had gone down too, but that a wise burger put in for them. But shall all our houses of resort in the suburbs be pulled down? To the ground, mistress. Why, oh, here's a change indeed in the Commonwealth. What should become of me? Come, fear not you. Good counsellors lack no clients. <laughs> Though you change your place, you need not change your trade. <laughs> oh, be your tapster still. <laughs> Courage, there will be pity taken on you. You that have worn your eyes almost out in the service, <laughs> you will be considered. What's to do here, Thomas Tapster? It's withdrawal. Here comes Senior Claudio, led by the provost to prison. It, and there's Madame Juliet. Fellow? Why dost thou show me thus to the world? 
Bear me to prison where I am committed. I do it not in evil disposition, but from Lord Angelo by special charge. Thus can the demigod authority make us pay down for our offense by weight. Words of heaven. On whom it will, it will. On whom it will not, so. If still tis just. Why, how now, Claudio? Whence comes this restraint? From too much liberty, my Lucio. Liberty. As surfeit as the father of much fast, so every scope by the immoderate use turns to restraint. Our natures to pursue, like rats that ravin down their proper bane, a thirsty evil. And when we drink, we die. If I could speak so wisely under an arrest, I would send for certain of my creditors. And yet, to say the truth, I had as lief have the foppery of freedom as the morality of imprisonment. What's thy offence, Claudio? What but to speak of would offend again. What is murder? No. Lecture it? Call it so. Away, oh, sir, you must go. One word, good friend. Lucio, a word with you. A hundred, if they'll do you any good. Is lechery so looked after? Thus stands it with me. Upon a true contract, I got possession of Julietta's bed. You know the lady, she is fast my wife, save that we do the denunciation lack of outward order. This we came not to, only for propagation of a dar remaining in the coffer of her friends, from whom we thought it meet to hide our love till time had made them for us. But it chances the stealth of our most mutual entertainment with character too gross is writ on Juliet. With child, perhaps. Unhappily, even so. And a new deputy now for the Duke, whether it be the fault and glimpse of newness, or whether that the body public be a horse whereon the governor doth ride, who newly in the seat that it may know he can command lets it straight feel the spur, whether the tyranny be in his place or in his eminence that fills it up, I stagger him. But this new governor awakes me all the enrolled penalties which have like unscoured armor hung by the wall so long that nineteen zodiacs have gone round and none of them been worn. And for a name, now puts the drowsy and neglected act freshly on me. Tis surely for a name. I warrant it is. And thy head stands so tickle on thy shoulders that a milkmaid, if she be in love, may sigh it off. Send after the duke and appeal to her. I have done so, but he's not to be found. I prithee, Lucio, do me this kind service. This day, my sister should the cloister enter and there receive her approbation. Acquaint her with the danger of my state. Implore her in my voice that she make friends to the strict deputy. Bid herself assay him. I have great hope in that. For in her youth there is a prone and speechless dialect such as move men. Beside, she hath prosperous art when she will play with reason and discourse. And well she can persuade. I pray she may. As well for the encouragement of the like, which else would stand under grievous imposition, as for the enjoying of thy life, who I would be sorry should be thus foolishly lost at a game of tic-tac. I'll to her. I thank you, good friend Lucio. Within two hours. Come, officer. Away. No. Holy Father, throw away that thought. Believe not that the dribbling dart of love can pierce a complete bosom. Why I desire thee to give me secret harbor hath a purpose more grave and wrinkled than the aims and ends of burning youth. May your grace speak of it. My holy sir, none better knows than you how I have ever loved the life removed and held in idle price to haunt assemblies where youth and cost and witless bravery keeps. I have delivered to Lord Angelo, a man of stricture and firm abstinence, my absolute power and place here in Vienna, and he supposes me traveled to Poland, for so I obtrude it in the common ear, and so it is received. Now, pious sir, you will demand of me why I do this. Gladly, my lord. We have strict statutes and most biting laws, the needful bits and curbs to headstrong weeds, which for these fourteen years we have let slip. Even like an o'ergrown lion in a cave that goes not out to prey. Now, as fond fathers having bound up threatening twigs of birch, only to stick it in their children's sight for terror, not to use, in time the rod becomes more mocked than fear. So our decrees dead to infliction to themselves are dead, and liberty plucks justice by the nose, the baby beats the nurse, 
and quite a sort goes all decorum. It rested in your grace to unloose this tied-up justice when you pleased, and it in you more dreadful would have seemed than in Lord Angelo. I do fear too dreadful. Sith t'was my fault to give the people scope, t'would be my tyranny to strike and gall them for what I bid them do. For we bid this be done when evil deeds have their permissive pass and not their punishment. Therefore, indeed, my father, I have on Angelo imposed the office, who may, in the ambush of my name, strike home, and yet my nature never in the fight to do in slander. And to behold his sway, I will, as t'were a brother of your order, visit both prince and people. Therefore, I prithee, supply me with the habit and instruct me how I may formally in person bear like a true friar. No reason for this action at our more leisure shall I render you. Only this one. Lord Angelo is precise, stands as a guard with envy, scarce confesses that his blood flows or that his appetite is more to bread than stone. Hence shall we see, if power change purpose, what our seamers be. And have you nuns no farther privileges? Are not these large enough? Yes, truly. I speak not as desiring more, but rather wishing a more strict restraint upon the sisterhood, the votarists of St. Clair. Oh, peace be in this place. Who's that which calls? It is a man's voice. Gentle Isabella, turn you the key and know his business of him. You may, I may not. You are yet unsworn. When you have vowed, you must not speak with men, but in the presence of the prize. Then, if you speak, you must not show your face, or if you show your face, you must not speak. Oh! He calls again. I pray you answer him. Peace and prosperity. Who is it that calls? Hail, virgin, if you be. As those cheek roses proclaim you are no less, can you so stead me as bring me to the sight of Isabella, a novice of this place, and the fair sister to her unhappy brother, Claudio? Why her unhappy brother? Let me ask, the rather for I now must make you know, I am that Isabella and his sister. Gentle and fair, your brother kindly greets you. Not to be weary with you, he's in prison. Oh, me, for what? For that which, if myself might be his judge, he should receive his punishment and thanks. He hath got his friend with child. Sir, make me not your story. It is true. I would not. Though tis my familiar sin with maids to seem the lapwing and a jest tongue far from heart, play with all virgins so. I hold you as a thing enskied and sainted by your announcement an immortal spirit and to be talk with in sincerity, as with a saint. You do blaspheme the good in mocking me. Do not believe it. Fewness and truth is thus. Your brother and his lover have embraced. As those that feed grow full, as blossoming time that from the seedness the bare fallow brings to teeming poison, even so her plenteous womb expresseth his full tilt and husbandry. Someone with child by him? My cousin Julius. Is she your cousin? Well, adoptedly, as schoolmaids change their names by vain, though apt affection. She it is. Oh, let him marry her. This is the point. The Duke is very strangely gone from hence. Bore many gentlemen, myself being one in hand and hope of action. But we do learn by those that know the very nerves of state his givings out were of an infinite distance from his true meant design. Upon his place, and with full line of his authority, governs Lord Angelo, a man whose blood is very snow broth, one who never feels the wanton stings and motions of the sense, but doth rebate and blunt his natural edge with profits of the mines, tuggy and fast. He, to give fear to use and liberty, which have for long run by the hideous law as mice by lions, hath picked out an act under whose heavy sense your brother's life falls into forfeit. He arrests him on it, and follows close the rigour of the statute to make him an example. 
All hope is gone unless you have the grace, by your fair prayer, to soften Angelo. And that's my tip of business, twixt you and your poor brother. Doth he so seek his life? Has censured him already. And as I hear, the provost hath a warrant for his execution. Alas. What poor abilities in me to do him good? I say, the power you have. My power? Alas, I doubt. Our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Go to Lord Angelo and let him learn to know when maidens sue, men give like gods. But when they weep and kneel, all their petitions are as freely theirs as they themselves would owe them. I'll see what I can do. But speedily. I will about it straight. No longer staying, but to give the mother notice of my affair. I humbly thank you. Commend me to my brother. Soon at night, I'll send him certain word of my success. I take my leave of you. Good sir, adieu. We must not make a scarecrow of the law setting it up to fear the birds of prey and let it keep one shape till custom make it their perch and not their terror. Aye, but yet let us be keen and rather cut a little than fall and bruise to death. Alas, this gentleman whom I would save had a most noble father. Let but your honor know whom I believe to be most straight in virtue that in the working of your own affections had time cohered with place, or place with wishing, or that the resolute acting of your blood could have attained the effect of your own purpose, whether you had not some time in your life erred in this point which now you censure him and pull the law upon you. It is one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. I not deny the jury passing on the prisoner's life may in the sworn twelve have a thief or two guiltier than him they try. What's open made to justice, that justice seizes. What know the laws that thieves do pass on thieves? Tis very pregnant a jewel that we find. We stoop and take it because we see it. But what we do not see, we tread upon and never think of it. You may not so extenuate his offense, for I have had such faults. But rather tell me, when I that censure him do so offend, let mine own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come in partial. Sir, he must die. Be it as your wisdom will. Where is the provost? Here, if it like your honor. See that Claudio be executed by nine tomorrow morning. Bring him his confessor and let him be prepared. For that's the utmost of his pilgrimage. Well, heaven forgive him. And forgive us all. Some rise by sin and some by virtue fall. Some run from breaks of ice and answer none, and some condemn it for a fault alone. Come, bring them away. If these be good people in the commonweal that do nothing but use their abuses in common houses, I know no law. Bring them away. Now, now, sir, what's your name? And what's the matter? If it please, Your Honour, I am the poor Duke's constable, and my name is Elbow. I do lean upon justice, sir, and do bring in here before your good honour two notorious benefactors. Benefactors? Well, what benefactors are they? Are they not malefactors? If it please, Your Honour, I know not well what they are. But precise villains they are, that I am sure of, and void of all proper nation in the world that good Christians ought to have. <laughs> this comes off well. Here's a wise officer. Go to. What quality are they of? Elbow is your name? Why dost thou not speak, Elbow? He cannot, sir. He's out of Elbow. What are you, sir? He, sir? A tapster, sir, parcel board, one that serves a bad woman, whose house, sir, was, as they say, plucked down in the suburbs, and now she professes a hot house, which I think is a very ill house, too. How know you that? My wife, sir, whom I detest before heaven and your honour. How, my wife? I, sir, whom I thank heaven is an honest woman. Dost thou detest her, therefore? I say, sir, I will detest myself also, as well as she, that this house, if it be not a board's house, it is pity of her life, for it is a naughty house. How dost thou know that, constable? Harry, sir, by my wife. 
who, if she'd been a woman cardinally given, might have been accused in fornication, adultery, and all uncleanliness there. By the woman's means? Aye, sir, by Mistress Overdone's means. But as she spit in his face, so she divided him. Sir, if it please your honour, this is not so. Prove it before these varlets here, thou honourable man. Prove it. <laughs> Do you hear how he misplaces? Sir, she came in great with child, and longing, saving your honour's reverence, for stewed prunes. Sir, we had but two in the house, which at that very distant time stood, as it were, in a fruit dish. A dish of some three pence. Your honours have seen such dishes. They're not china dishes, but very good dishes. Go to, go to. No matter for the dish, sir. No, indeed, sir. Not of a pin. You are therein in the right. But to the point. As I say, this mistress elbow, being, as I said, with child, and being great-bellied, and longing, as I said, for prunes, and having but two in the dish, as I said, Master Fothier, this very man, having eaten the rest, as I said, and as I say, paying for them very honestly, for, as you know, Master Froth, I could not give you three pence again. No, oh, indeed. Very well. Now, you being then, if you be remembered, cracking the stones uh, of the four said prunes. Uh, uh, so I did indeed. Why, very well. I telling you then, if you be remembered, that such a one and such a one were past cure of the thing you wot of, unless they kept very good time. As I told you. All, all this is true. Boy, very well then. Come, you are a tedious fool, to the purpose. What was done to Elbow's wife that he hath cause to complain of? Come me to what was done to her. Sir, your honour cannot come to that yet. No, sir, nor I mean it not. Sir, but you shall come to it by your honour's leave. And I beseech you, look into Master Froth here, sir. A man of fourscore pound a year, whose father died at Alamas. What's not at Alamas, Master Froth? All oh, had indeed. Why, very well. I hope here be truths. He, sir, sitting as I say in a lower chair, sir, it was in the bunch of grapes. Where indeed you have a delight to sit, have you not? I, I, I have so, because it's it's an open room and good for winter. Why? Very well then. I hope here be truths. This will last out a night in Russia when nights are longest there. I'll take my leave and leave you to the hearing of the cause, hoping you'll find good cause to whip them all. I think no less. Good morrow to your lordship. Now, sir, come on. What was done to Elbow's wife once more? Once, sir? There was nothing done to her once. I beseech you, sir, ask him what this man did to my wife. I beseech your honour, ask me. Well, sir, what did this gentleman to her? I beseech you, sir, look in this gentleman's face. Good master Froth, look upon his honour, tis for a good purpose. Doth your honour mark his face? Aye, sir, very well. Aye, I beseech you, mark it well. Well, I do so. Doth your honour see any harm in his face? I know. I'll be supposed upon a book his face is the worst thing about him. Good, then. If his face be the worst thing about him, how could Master Froth do the constable's wife any harm? I would know that of your honour. He's in the right, constable. What say you to it? First, and it like you, the house is a respected house. Next, this is a respected fellow, and his mistress is a respected woman. By this answer, his wife is a more respected person than any of us all. Varlet, thou liest, thou liest, wicked varlet. The time is yet to come that she will ever respect him with man, woman, or child. Sir, she was respected with him before he married with her. <laughs> Which is the wiser here, justice or iniquity? Is this true? Oh, thou caitiff, oh, thou varlet, oh, thou wicked Hannibal. I respected with her before I was married to her. If ever I was respected with her, or she with me, let not your worship think me the poor duke's officer. Prove this, thou wicked Hannibal, or I'll have mine action of battery on thee. If he took you a box of the ear, you might have your action of slander, too. Marry, I thank your good worship for it. What is your worship's pleasure I shall do with this wicked caitiff? Truly, officer, because he hath some offences in him that thou wouldst discover, if thou couldst, let him continue in his courses till thou knowest what they are. Ah, Mary, I thank your worship for it. 
Thou seest thou wicked varlet now, what's come upon thee. Thou art to continue now, thou varlet. Thou art to continue. Where were you born, friend? Here, in Vienna, sir. Are you a fourscore pounds a year? Yes, and, and please you, sir. Sir, what trade are you of, sir? A tapster, a poor widow's tapster. Your mistress's name? Mistress Overdone. Has she had any more than one husband? Nine, sir. Overdone by the last. Nine? Come hither to me, Master Frost. <laughs> uh, Master Frost, I would not have you acquainted with tapsters. Huh? They will draw you, Master Frost, and you will hang them. Huh? Get you gone, and let me hear no more of you. Oh, oh. Well, thank you, Worship. For my own part, I, I, I never come into any room in the tap house. I... But I'm drawn in. Well, no more of it, Master Frost. Well, well. Uh, come you hither to me, Master Tapster. What's your name, Master Tapster? Pompey. What else? Bum, sir. Truth. And your bum is the greatest thing about you. So that in the beastliest sense you are Pompey the Great. <laughs> Pompey? You are partly a bore, Pompey. Howsoever you colour it in being a tapster, are you not? Come, tell me true, which will be the better for you. Truly, sir. I'm a poor fellow that would live. How would you live, Pompey? By being a bore? What do you think of the trade, Pompey? Is it a lawful trade? If the law would allow it, sir. But the law will not allow it, Pompey, nor it shall not be allowed in Vienna. But does your worship mean to gold and splay all the youth of the city? No, Pompey. Well, truly, sir, in my poor opinion, they would do it then. Well, if your worship would take order for the drabs and the knaves, you need not to fear the fawns. There is pretty orders beginning, I can tell you. It is but heading and hanging. Well, if you head and hang all that offend that way but for ten years together, you'll be glad to give out a commission for more heads. If this law old in Vienna ten years, I'll rent the fairest house in it of the three pence a bay. If you live to see this come to pass, say Pompey told you so. Thank you, good Pompey. And in requital of your prophecy, hark you. I advise you, let me not find you before me again upon any complaint whatsoever. No, not for dwelling where you do. If I do, Pompey, I shall beat you to your tent and prove a shrewd Caesar to you. <laughs> in plain dealing, Pompey, I shall have you whipped. So for this time, Pompey, fare you well. I thank your worship for your good counsel. I shall follow it as the flesh and fortune shall better determine. Whip me? No, no. Let calm man whip his jade. The valiant art's not whipped out of his trade. Uh, come hither to me, Master Elbow. Uh, come hither, Master Constable. Mm, how long have you been in this place of Constable? Seven year and a half, sir. Ah. I thought by your readiness in the office you had continued in it some time. Uh, you say seven years together? And a half, sir. Alas, it hath been great pains to you. They do you wrong to put you so oft apart. Are there not men in your ward sufficient to serve it? For oh, faith, sir, few of any wit in such matters. As they are chosen, they are glad to choose me for them. <laughs> I do it for some piece of money and go through with all... Look, you bring me in the names of some six or seven the most sufficient of your parish. To your worship's house, sir. To my house. Very well. Uh, what's o'clock, think you? Eleven, sir. I pray you home to dinner with me. I humbly thank you. It grieves me for the death of Claudio. <sighs> But there's no remedy. Lord Angelo is severe. It is but needful. Mercy is not itself that oft looks so. Pardon is still the nurse of second woe. <sighs> but yet, poor Claudio, there's no remedy. Come, sir.
he's hearing of a cause, he will come straight. I'll tell him of it. Pray you do. I'll know his pleasure. Maybe he will relent. Alas, he hath but as offended in a dream. All sects, all ages smack of this vice, and he to die for it? Now, what's the matter, Provost? Is it your will Claudio shall die tomorrow? Did not I tell thee, yea? Hadst thou not order, why dost thou ask again? Lest I might be too rash. Under your good correction, I have seen when, after execution, judgment hath repented o'er his doom. Go to, let that be mine. Do you your office, or give up your place, and you shall well be spared. I crave your honour's pardon. What shall be done, sir, with the groaning Juliet? She's very near her hour. Dispose of her to some more fitter place, and that with speed. Here is the sister of the man condemned desires access to you. One Lucio with her. Hath he a sister? Ay, my good lord, a very virtuous maid, and to be shortly of a sisterhood, if not already. Well, let them be admitted. See you the fornicatress be removed. Let her have needful, but not lavish means. There shall be order for it. Save your honour. Stay a little while. You're welcome. What's your will? I am a woeful suitor to your honour. Please, but your honour, hear me. Well, what's your suit? There is a vice that most I do abhor, and most desire should meet the blow of justice, for which I would not plead, but that I must. For which I must not plead, but that I am at war twixt will and will not. Well, the matter. I have a brother is condemned to die. I do beseech you, let it be his fault, and not my brother. Heaven give thee moving graces. Condemn the fault, and not the actor of it. Why, every fault's condemned, ere it be done. Mine were the very cipher of a function, to find the faults whose fine stands in record, and let go by the actor. Oh, just, but severe law. I had a brother then. Heaven keep your honour. Give not our soul to him again, entreat him, kneel down before him, hang upon his gown. You are too cold. If you should need a pin, you could not with more tame a tongue desire it to him, I say. Must he needs die? Maiden, no remedy. Yes. I do think that you might pardon him, and neither heaven nor man grieve at the mercy. I will not do it. But can you, if you would? Look, what I will not, that I cannot do. But might you do it, and do the world no wrong? If so, your heart were touched with that remorse as mine is to him. He is sentenced. Tis too late. You are too cold. Too late? Why, no. I that do speak a word may call it back again. Well, believe this. No ceremony that to great ones longs. Not the king's crown, not the deputed sword, the marshal's truncheon, nor the judge's robe, become them with one half so good a grace as mercy does. If he had been as you, and you as he, you would have slipped like him, but he, like you, would not have been so stern. Pray you be gone. I would to heaven I had your potency, and you were Isabel. Should it then be thus? No. I would tell what where to be a judge and what a prisoner. I touch him. There's the flame. Your brother is a forfeit of the law, and you but waste your words. Alas. Alas. Why all the souls that were were forfeit once? And he that might the vantage best have took found out the remedy. How would you be if he which is the top of judgment should but judge you as you are? Oh, think on that, and mercy then will breathe within your lips like man you made. Be you content, fair maid. It is the law, not I, condemn your brother. Were he my kinsman, brother, or my son, it should be thus with him. He must die tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, that's sudden. Spare him. Spare him. He's not prepared for death. 
Even for our kitchens we kill the fowl of season. Shall we serve heaven with less respect than we do minister to our gross selves? Good, good, my lord, bethink you. Who is it that hath died for this offence? There's many have committed it. I well say it. The law hath not been dead, though it hath slept. Those many had not dared to do that evil, if that the first that did the edict infringe had answered for his deed. Now tis awake, takes note of what is done, and like a prophet looks in a glass that shows what future evils, either now or by remissness new conceived, and so in progress to be hatched and born, are now to have no successive degrees, but ere they live to end. Yet show some pity. I show it most of all when I show justice. For then I pity those I do not know, which a dismissed offence would after gall, and do him right that answering one foul wrong lives not to act another. Be satisfied, your brother dies tomorrow, be content. So you must be the first that gives his sentence, and he that suffers. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. That's well said. Could great men thunder as Jove himself does, Jove would ne'er be quiet. For every pelting, petty officer would use his heaven for thunder, nothing but thunder. Merciful heaven! Thou, rather, with thy sharp and sulphurous bolt, splits the unwedgeable and gnarled oak than the soft myrtle. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what is most assured, his glassy essence like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep. Who, with our spleens, would all themselves laugh mortal? Oh, to him, to him, when she will relent, he's coming, I perceive. Pray heaven she win him. We cannot weigh our brother with ourselves. Great men may jest with saints, tis wit in them, but in the less foul profanation. Thou art the right, girl, more of that. That in the captain's but a choleric word, which in the soldier is flat blasphemy. Art advised of that, more on't. Why do you put these sayings upon me? Because authority, though it err like others, hath yet a kind of medicine in itself that skins the vice at the top. Go to your bosom, knock there, and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault. If it confess a natural guiltiness such as is his, let it not sound a thought upon your tongue against my brother's life. She speaks, and tis such sense that my sense breeds with it. Fare you well. Gentle, my lord, turn back. I will bethink me. Come again tomorrow. How, how I'll bribe you, good my lord, turn back. How? Bribe me? I, with such gifts that heaven shall share with you. You would not all else. Not with fond sickles of the tested gold, or stones whose rates are either rich or poor as fancy values them, but with true prayers that shall be up at heaven and enter there ere sunrise, prayers from preserved souls, from fasting maids whose minds are dedicate to nothing temporal. Well, come to me tomorrow. Go oh, to, tis well, away. Heaven keep your honor safe. Amen. For I am that way going to temptation, where prayers cross. At what hour tomorrow shall I attend your lordship? At any time, for noon. Save your honor. From thee, even from thy virtue. What's this? What's this? Is this her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted? Who sins most, huh? Not she. Nor doth she tempt. But it is I. That lying by the violet in the sun do as the carrion does, not as the flower corrupt with virtuous season. Can it be that modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness, having waste ground enough Shall we desire to raise the sanctuary and pitch our evils there? Oh, fie, fie, fie. What dost thou? Oh, what art thou, Angelo? 
Dost thou desire her foul liver, those things that make her good? Oh, let her brother live. Thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. What do I love her? That I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes. What didst I dream of? Oh, cunning enemy, that to catch a saint with saints dost bait thy hook. Most dangerous is that temptation that doth goad us on to sin in loving virtue. Never could the strumpet, with all her double vigor, art and nature, once stir my temper. But this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. Hail to you, provost. So I think you are. I am the provost. What's your will, good friar? Bound by my charity and my blessed order, I come to visit the afflicted spirits here in the prison. Do me the common right to let me see them, and to make me know the nature of their crimes, that I may minister to them accordingly. I would do more than that if more were needful. Look, here comes one. A gentlewoman of mine who, falling in the flaws of her own youth, hath blistered her report. She is with child, and he that got it sentenced. A young man more fit to do another such offence than die for this. When must he die? As I do think, tomorrow. I have provided for you. Stay a while, and you shall be conducted. Repent you, fair one, of the sin you carry? I do. And bear the shame most patiently. I'll teach you how you shall arraign your conscience and try your penitence if it be sound or horribly put on. How gladly learn. Love you, the man that wronged you? Yes, as I love the woman that wronged him. So then, it seems your most offenseful act was mutually committed. Mutually. Then was your sin of heavier kind than his? I do confess it. And repent it, father. Tis me so, daughter. But lest you do repent, as that the sin has brought you to this shame, which sorrow is always towards ourselves, not heaven, showing we would not spare heaven as we love it, but as we stand in fear. I do repent me as it is an evil, and take the shame with joy. There rest. Your partner as I hear, must die tomorrow. <gasps> and I am going with instruction to him. Grace, go with you. Benedicite. <gasps> must die tomorrow? Oh, injurious love that respites me a life, whose very comfort is still a dying horror. <gasps> Tis pity of him. <laughs> When I would pray and think, I think and pray to several subjects. Heaven hath my empty words, whilst my invention hearing not my tongue anchors on Isabel. Heaven in my mouth, as if I did but only chew his name, and in my heart the strong and swelling evil of my conception. The state whereon I studied is like a good thing being often read, grown seer and tedious, yea, my gravity, wherein let no man hear me, I take pride. Could I with boot change for an idle plume which the air beats for vain? O oh, place, O oh, form, how often dost thou with thy case, thy habit, wrench awe from fools and tie the wiser souls to thy false seeming blood? Thou art blood. Let's write good angel on the devil's horn. Tis now the devil's crest. How now, who's there? One Isabel, a sister, desires access to you. Teach her the way. 
Oh, heavens, why does my blood thus muster to my heart? Making both it unable for itself and, and dispossessing all my other parts of necessary fitness. So play the foolish throngs with one that swoons, come all to help him, and so stop the air by which he should revive. And even so, the general subject to a well-wished king quit their own part and in obsequious fondness crowd to his presence where their untaught love must needs appear offence. How now, fair maid? I am come to know your pleasure. You might know it would much better please me than to demand what tis. Your brother cannot live. Even so, him keep your honor. Yet may he live a while, and it may be as long as you or I, yet he must die. Under your sentence? Yea. When I beseech you that in his reprieve, longer or shorter, he may be so fitted that his soul sicken not. Ah, fie, these filthy vices. It were as good to pardon him that hath from nature stolen a man already made as to remit their saucy sweetness that to coin heaven's image in stamps that are forbid. Tis all as easy falsely to take away a life true made as to put metal in restrained mints to make a false one. It is set down so in heaven, but not in earth. Say you so, then I shall pose you quickly. Which had you rather that the most just law now took your brother's life, or to redeem him, give up your body to such sweet uncleanness as she that he hath stained? Sir, believe this, I had rather give my body than my soul. I talk not of your soul. Our compelled sins stand more for number than for a compt. How say you? Nay, I'll not warrant that, for I can speak against the thing I say. Answer to this. I, now the voice of the recorded law, pronounce a sentence on your brother's life. Might there not be a charity in sin to save this brother's life? Please you to do it. I'll take it as a peril to my soul. It is no sin at all but charity. Pleased you to do it at peril of your soul, to an equal poise of sin and charity. That I do beg his life, if it be sin, heaven let me bear it. You granting of my suit, if that be sin, I'll make it my mourn prayer to have it added to the faults of mine, and nothing of your answer. Nay, but hear me, your sense pursues not mine. Either you are ignorant or seem so craftily, and that's not good. Let me be ignorant and in nothing good, but graciously to know I am no better. Thus wisdom wishes to appear most bright when it doth tax itself. As those black masks proclaim an end shell beauty ten times louder than beauty could displayed. But mark me, to be received it plain, I'll speak more gross. Your brother is to die. So. And his offense is so, as it appears, accountant to the law upon that pain. True. Admit no other way to save his life. As I subscribe not that nor any other but in the loss of question, that you, his sister, finding yourself desired of such a person whose credit with the judge or own great place could fetch your brother from the manacles of the old binding law, and that there were no earthly mean to save him, but that either you must lay down the treasures of your body to this supposed, or else to let him suffer, what would you do? As much for my poor brother as myself. That is, were I under the terms of death, the impression of keen whips I'd wear as rubies and strip myself to death as to a bed that longing had been sick for where I'd yield my body up to shame. Then must your brother die. And were the cheaper way, better it were a brother died at once than that a sister, by redeeming him, should die forever. Were not you then as cruel as the sentence that you have slandered so? Ignomy in ransom and free pardon are of two houses. Lawful mercy is nothing kin to foul redemption. You seemed of late to make the law a tyrant and rather prove the sliding of your brother a merriment than a vice. Oh, pardon me, my lord. It oft falls out to have what we would have. We speak not what we mean. I something to excuse the thing I hate for his advantage that I dearly love. We are all frail. 
Else let my brother die, if not a Feodori, but only he owe, and succeed thy weakness. Nay, women are frail too. Aye, as the glasses, where they view themselves, which are as easy broke as they make forms. Women help heaven. Men their creation mar in profiting by them. Nay, call us ten times frail, for we are soft as our complexions are, and credulous to false prints. I think it well. And from this testimony of your own sex, since I suppose we are made to be no stronger than faults may shake our frames, let me be bold. I do arrest your words. Be that you are, that is a woman. If you be more, you're none. If you be one, as you are well expressed, by all external warrants, show it now by putting on the destined livery. I have no tongue but one. Gentle, my lord, let me entreat you speak the former language. Plainly conceive, I love you. My brother did love Juliet, and you tell me that he shall die for it. He shall not, Isabel, if you give me love. I know your virtue hath a license in it which seems a little fouler than it is to pluck on others. Believe me on mine honor. My words express my purpose. Oh, <laughs> little honor to be much believed and most pernicious purpose uh, is seeming, seeming. I will proclaim thee, Angelo. Look for it. Sign me a present pardon for my brother, or with an outstretched throat I'll tell the world aloud what man thou art. Who will believe thee, Isabel? My unsoiled name, the austereness of my life, my vouch against you and my place in the state will so your accusation overweigh that you shall stifle in your own report and smell of calumny. I have begun, and now I give my sense you will race the rain. Fit thy consent to my sharp appetite. Lay by all nicety and prolixious blushes that banish what they sue for. Redeem thy brother by yielding up thy body to my will, or else he must not only die the death, but thy unkindness shall his death draw out to lingering sufferance. Answer me tomorrow, or by the affection that now guides me most, I'll prove a tyrant to him. As for you, say what you can. My false outweighs your true. <laughs> to whom should I complain? Did I tell this? Who would believe me? Oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the selfsame tongue, either of condemnation or approof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. <laughs> I'll to my brother. Though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood, Yet hath he in him such a mind of honor that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'd yield them up before his sister should her body stoop to such abhorred pollution. Then Isabel, live chaste, and brother, die. More than our brother is our chastity. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. So then you hope of pardon from Lord Angelo. The miserable have no other medicine but only hope. I've hoped to live and am prepared to die. Be absolute for death. Either death or life shall thereby be the sweeter. Reason thus with life. If I do lose thee, I do lose a thing that none but fools would keep. A breath thou art, servile to all the sky influences that doth this habitation where thou keepst hourly afflict. Merely thou art death's fool, 
For him thou laborest by thy flight to shun, and yet runst toward him still. Thou art not noble, for all the accommodations that thou bearest are nursed by baseness. Thou art by no means valiant, for thou dost fear the soft and tender fork of a poor worm. The best of rest is sleep, and that thou oft provokest, yet grossly fearest thy death, which is no more. Thou art not thyself, for thou exists on many a thousand grains that issue out of dust. Happy thou art not, for what thou hast not, still thou strivest to get, and what thou hast, forgettest. Thou art not certain, for thy complexion shifts to strange effects after the moon. If thou art rich, Thou art poor, for, like an ass whose back with ingots bows, thou bearest thy heavy riches but a journey, and death unloads thee. Friend hast thou none, for thine own bowels, which do call thee sire, the mere effusion of thy proper loins, do curse the gout, sapigo, and the room for ending thee not sooner. Thou hast not youth nor age, but, as it were, an after-dinner sleep dreaming on both. For all thy blessed youth becomes as aged and does beg the arms of palsied eld. And when thou art old and rich, thou hast neither heat, affection, limb, nor beauty to make thy riches pleasant. What yet in this that bears the name of life? Yet in this life lie hid more thousand deaths. Yet death we fear that makes these odds all even. I humbly thank you. To sue to live, I find I seek to die. And seeking death, find life. Let it come on. What ho? Peace here. Grace and good company. Who's there? Well, come in. The wish deserves a welcome. Dear sir, ere long I'll visit you again. Most holy sir, I thank you. My business is a word or two with Claudia. And very welcome. Look, signor, here's your sister. Provost, a word with you. As many as you please. Bring me to hear them speak where I may be conceived. Now, sister, what's the comfort? Why, as all comforts are, most good, most good indeed. Lord Angelo, having affairs to heaven, intends you for his swift ambassador, where you shall be an everlasting leisure. Therefore, your best appointment make with speed. Tomorrow you set on. Is there no remedy? None. But such remedy as to save a head, to cleave a heart in twain. But is there any? Yes, brother. You may live. There is a devilish mercy in the judge, if you'll implore it, that will free your life, but fetter you till death. Perpetual durance? I just perpetual durance. A restraint, though all the world's vastidity you had to a determined scope. But in what nature? In such a one as you consenting to it would bark your honor from that trunk you bear and leave you naked. Let me know the point. Oh, I do fear thee, Claudio, and I quake lest thou a feverous life shouldst entertain and six or seven winters more respect than a perpetual honor. Darest thou die? The sense of death is most in apprehension, and the poor beetle that we tread upon in corporal sufferance finds a pang as great as when a giant dies. Why give you me this shame? Think you I can a resolution fetch from flowery tenderness? If I must die, 
I will encounter darkness as a bride and hug it in mine arms. There spake my brother. There my father's grave did utter forth a voice. Yes, thou must die. Thou art too noble to conserve a life in base appliances. This outward sainted deputy, whose settled visage and deliberate word nips youth i' the head, and follies doth emmew as falcon doth the fowl, is yet a devil. His filth within being cast, he would appear a pond as deep as hell. The Prenzi Angelo? Oh, tis the cunning livery of hell. The damnest body to invest and cover in Prenzi guards. Dost thou think, Claudio, if I would yield him my virginity, thou mightst be free. Oh, heavens, it cannot be. Yes, he would give it thee. From this rank offence, so to offend him still. This night's the time that I should do what I abhor to name, or else thou diest tomorrow. Thou shalt not do't. Oh, were it but my life, I'd throw it down for your deliverance as frankly as a pin. Thanks, dear Isabel. Be ready, Claudio, for your death tomorrow. Yes. Has he affections in him that thus can make him bite the law by the nose when he would force it? Sure it is no sin, or of the deadly seven it is the least. Which is the least? If it were damnable, he being so wise, why would he, for the momentary trick, be perjurably fined? Oh, Isabel. What says my brother? Death is a fearful thing. And shamed life, a hateful. Aye, but to die. And go we know not where. To lie in cold obstruction and to rot. This sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod. And the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods or to reside in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice. To be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world. Or to be worse than worst of those that lawless and incertain thought imagine howling. Tis too horrible. The weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. Alas, alas. Sweet sister, let me live. What sin you do to save a brother's life? Nature dispenses with the deed so far that it becomes a virtue. Oh, you beast. Oh, faithless coward. Oh, dishonest wretch. Wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? Is not a kind of incest to take life from thine own sister's shame? <laughs> what should I think? Heaven shield my mother played my father fair, for such a warped slip of wilderness ne'er issued from his blood. Take my defiance. Die, perish. Might but my bending down reprieve thee from thy fate, it should proceed. I'll pray a thousand prayers for thy death. No word to save thee. Nay, hey, hear me, Isabel. Oh, fie, fie, fie. Thy sin's not accidental, but a trade. Mercy to thee would prove itself a board. Tis best thou diest quickly. Oh, hear me, Isabella. Vouchsafe a word, young sister, but one word. What is your will? Might you dispense with your leisure? I would by and by have some speech with you. The satisfaction I would require is likewise your own benefit. I have no superfluous leisure. My stay must be stolen out of other affairs. But I will attend you a while. Son, I have overheard what hath passed between you and your sister. Angelo had never the purpose to corrupt her. Only hath he made an essay of her virtue to practice his judgment with the disposition of natures. She, having the truth of honor in her, hath made him that gracious denial which he is most glad to receive. I am confessor to Angelo. I know this to be true. Therefore, prepare yourself to death. Do not satisfy your resolution with hopes that are fallible. Tomorrow you must die. Go to your knees and make ready. Let me ask my sister pardon. I am 
so out of love with life that I will sue to be rid of it. Hold you there. Farewell. Provost, a word with you. What's your will, father? That now you are come, you will be gone. Leave me a while with the maid. My mind promises with my habit no loss shall touch her by my company. In good time. The hand that has made you fair has made you good. The goodness that is cheap in beauty makes beauty brief in goodness. But grace, being the soul of your complexion, shall keep the body of it ever fair. The assault that Angelo hath made to you Fortune hath conveyed to my understanding. And, but that frailty hath examples for his falling, I should wonder at Angelo. How will you do to content this substitute and save your brother? I am now going to resolve him. I had rather my brother die by the law than my son should be unlawfully born. But, oh, how much is the good Duke deceived in Angelo. If ever he return and I can speak to him, I will open my lips in vain or discover his government. That shall not be much amiss. Yet, as the matter now stands, he will avoid your accusation. He made trial of you only. Therefore, fasten your ear on my advisings. To the love I have in doing good, a remedy presents itself. I do make myself believe that you may most uprightly do a poor wronged lady a merited benefit. Redeem your brother from the angry law, do no stain to your own gracious person, and much please the absent duke, if peradventure he shall ever return to have a hearing of this business. Well, let me hear you speak farther. I have spirit to do anything that appears not foul in the truth of my spirit. Virtue is bold and goodness never fearful. Have you not heard speak of Mariana, the sister of Frederick, the great soldier, who miscarried at sea? I have heard of the lady, and good words went with her name. She should this Angelo have married, was affianced to her by oath, and the nuptial appointed between which time of the contract and limit of the solemnity her brother Frederick was wrecked at sea, having in that perished vessel the dowry of his sister. But mark how heavily this befell to the poor gentlewoman. There she lost a noble and renowned brother in his love toward her ever most kind and natural. With him, the portion and sinew of her fortune, her marriage dowry. With both, her combinate husband, this well-seeming Angelo. Can this be so? Did Angelo so leave her? Left her in tears, and dried not one of them with his comfort, swallowed his vows whole, pretending in her discoveries of dishonour, in few, bestowed her on her own lamentation, which she yet wears for his sake, and he, a marble to her tears, is washed with them, but relents not. What a merit were it in death to take this poor maid from a world. What corruption in this life that it will let this man live. But how out of this can she avail? It is a rupture that you may easily heal. And the cure of it not only saves your brother, but keeps you from dishonour in doing it. Show me how, good father. This aforenamed maid hath yet in her the continuance of her first affection. His unjust unkindness, that in all reason should have quenched her love, hath, like an impediment in the current, made it more violent and unruly. Go you to Angelo. Answer his requiring with a plausible obedience. Agree with his demands to the point. Only refer yourself to this advantage. First, that your stay with him may not be long, and that the time may have all shadow and silence in it and the place answer to convenience. This being granted in course, and now follows all, we shall advise this wronged maid to stead up your appointment, go in your place. If the encounter acknowledges itself hereafter, it may compel him to her recompense. And here, by this, is your brother saved, your honor untainted, the poor Mariana advantaged, and the corrupt deputy scaled. The maid will I frame to make fit for his attempt. 
If you think well to carry this as you may, the doubleness of the benefit defends the deceit from reproof. What think you of it? The image of it gives me content already, and I trust it will grow to a most prosperous perfection. It lies much in your holding up. Haste you speedily to Angelo. If for this night he entreat you to his bed, give him promise of satisfaction. I will presently to St. Luke's. There, at the moated grange, resides this dejected Mariana. At that place, call upon me, and dispatch with Angelo, that it may be quickly... I thank you for this comfort. Fare you well, good father. 